This morning we are in the book of Titus, chapter 2, and if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Titus, and if you have need of a Bible this morning, these fine gentlemen would love to uh, put one in your hands. We're in a series entitled Multiplying Your Life, and we've been talking about multiplying your life through, and the first one was multiplying our lives through service. Last Sunday, we looked at multiplying our lives through redeeming the time, that is good time management. And this morning, we're talking about uh, multiplying your life through spiritual fitness, which is the theme here in the book of Titus, and we'll pick this up here in chapter 2. Let me just read for you, though, verse 1, which says, but as for you, the Apostle Paul writing now to Titus who is ministering on the island of Crete. He says, the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. The word sound there is the word that we get the English word hygiene from. The idea of having good hygiene leading then to good health. The idea that we can have a fit body. And the concept here this morning is that we can not only have a fit body, but we can be fit spiritually. And so let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. We'll ask God to bless this time that we have in the word of God. Father, we thank you so very much for giving to us hope through Jesus Christ. A confidence, Father, that you've passed to us because now we can be called children of God. Because our sins are paid for, Lord, we're so blessed and we thank you. Father, as we approach your word this morning, help it to be understood by those of us here, Father, who who truly want to know what your word says. At times, Father, we can be dull of hearing. Allow your spirit, I pray, to minister to us in a special way here today. That we might, Father, commit ourselves to being spiritually fit carrying out the purposes, Lord, that you have for each one of us. Father, I thank you for being here with us today, and I pray your blessing on our time in Christ's name. Amen. Paul introduces Timothy to the world of church planting, and in some ways, uh, Titus, rather, is a true church planter. We come to the book of Titus, even though it's a small book, it's really packed with a lot of information. There are a lot of things here that are extremely important for us to know and understand. When you think of where he's ministering, he's ministering to a very mountainous island in the Mediterranean known as Crete. It's southeast of Italy. It's out there at the mouth of the Aegean Sea. And it was uh, an island that was pretty well known. Unfortunately for them, it was, un- it was unfortunately known for having such low character among its inhabitants, which is a nice way of saying they were rascals. Uh, this was a tough bunch of individuals who were living on the island of Crete. I don't know if it would be like Dodge City or where, one of those western towns where they were always shooting people up. But the idea is that there was a lot of difficulty, immorality, there was a, a great deal of sin. It just seemed to overflow here on this island of Crete. And the Apostle Paul is, is going to come to, to, to Titus and he's going to tell him, here's the job that you have to do among these individuals. There was a Greek historian by the name of Polybius living in the second century, B.C. that is. He made the following statement about the Cretans. He said, money is so highly valued among them that its possession is not only thought to be necessary, but in the highest degree creditable. And in fact, greed and avarice are so native to the soil in Crete that they're the only people in the world among whom no stigma attaches to any sort of gain, and however they got that gain, whatever. Cretans, by their ingrained avarice, are engaged in countless public and private seditions, murders, and civil wars. I will now address myself, he says, to showing that the Cretan constitution deserves neither praise nor imitation. Now, with few exceptions, you could find no habits prevailing in private life more steeped in treachery than those in Crete and no public policy more inequitable. 
That's a ringing endorsement, isn't it? <laughs> How would you like to be from there? Hey, where are you from? Crete. Oh, okay, have a good day. I mean, you know, why would you want to hang out with some of those Cretans? And, and, and this is, the, this is the, the, the backdrop of what's happening here. And in fact, when the Apostle Paul is, is talking, he's going to, to speak to this issue a little later down in, in chapter 1. If you notice with me in chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes to Titus, he says, there are many rebellious men. They're empty talkers and they're deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, those who have a Jewish background. He says, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families. They're teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. There's the, the connection of the money back to, to what Polybius was saying. It, it was all about the, the money and these people are, are willing to slit your throat for it. Notice verse 12. The apostle says here, he says, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Nice. <laughs> then notice what the Bible says after that. This testimony is true. <laughs> he said, that's a true statement, by the way. Uh, the person that he was quoting was Epimendes. Uh, he was a 6th century uh, BC, that is, philosopher uh, and a religious prophet who really went against the grain of some of these creations or they went against his grain. He believed that Zeus was immortal. First of all, you had to believe that there was a Zeus and that that Zeus was immortal. And there were people on Crete who evidently didn't agree with that. And so he wrote a poem, and this is what the poem said, and this is where Paul gets his quote here. He says, they fashioned a tomb for thee, O holy and high one. That's, that's Epimenes speaking about Zeus. He says, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and idle bellies. But thou art not dead, thou livest and abidest forever. And this next part that he quotes, you might recall. For in thee we live and move and have our being. Wow. So the Apostle Paul quotes him not only once, but twice. Because if you go back to Acts 17, 28, when Paul is teaching there on Mars Hill and he's talking to the, to the folks there that have the statue to the unknown God, you may recall he points out that there is one creator who has created the universe and he talks about then shifting that creation to Jesus and he's basically saying, it's in Jesus that we have our life. It's in Jesus that we have our being. It's in Jesus that we live and move. It's in Jesus. Paul uses that quotation of Epimendes there so that he can share it with them. And now he uses this quote here in dealing with the Cretans, which is very, very apropos because Titus is going to be given an enormous responsibility. Notice in verse four of chapter one, giving you still more background to our text in chapter two. To Titus, he says, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Savior. For this reason, he says, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now, that was not going to be an easy task, but understand this, that every place that the gospel has ever gone, it's always penetrated a wicked society. Whether the gospel is taken to a group of people who would call themselves headhunters or whatever the case might be, wherever the gospel's gone, wh wherever it's penetrated its society, it has made huge inroads and changes to reflect the image of God in the hearts of the people as they convert to faith in Jesus Christ. In Crete, Titus is given the responsibility as he church plants of ordaining elders in the cities of Crete that have these churches. And Paul is going to say, namely there in verse six, if any man is above reproach. And then he goes on and he lists a whole category of things that need to be true about these people who will lead the church. He says, Titus, you're going to go into every city as I've directed you, appointing these elders. If you find a man who's above reproach, the husband of one wife, 
having children who believe, not accused of dissipations or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid game, but hospitable, loving what's good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he'll be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. This was an enormous task that Titus had, because Titus had to go and he had to seek out people who were biblically then qualified to serve in leadership in these churches. Where was he going to find these people? This isn't going to be a necessarily an easy, easy task. The dilemma has always been, and the question among pastors has always been, what do you do in a situation where you are perhaps starting a church and you don't have people yet who are qualified to be in positions of leadership in the church? What do you do? What's, what's okay and what's not okay? Is it okay for us to maybe take a few of those requirements kind of and ignore them a little bit? Really kind of change them up and, and, and say, well, no, we're going to just kind of push that to the side. Or, or is it a strict adherence that we need to have to the word of God? What Paul does is he gives to t- Titus here in chapter 2, in verse 1, an admonition. And the admonition is a simple one. You need to speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine because there needs to be a healthiness in the lives of the people of your church. And specifically, he's going to talk about the older men and then he's going to talk about the older women. He's going to talk about the younger women and then he's going to talk about the younger men. And those are the four areas this morning that I want to look at and examine for spiritual fitness. Again, we look there at chapter 2 and verse 1. The word for sound, and he talks about sound doctrine, again, is that word where we get the English word hygiene from. And the idea is that these people are spiritually healthy or spiritually fit. He will repeat the word sound in this text a couple of times. Being spiritually healthy should be the goal of every single one of us. Every one of us. And we, we have such an emphasis in our society today of physical health, don't we? I mean, it's all about exercising so we don't fall over. And the reality is we have no guarantees of anything, do we? But we exercise, and we exercise relentlessly. No doubt you're an exerciser at one time of your life or another, Right? Albert Einstein, he was 1939, he was talking to Princeton University, and he made this statement about exercise. He says that there is, um, he discovered that a tiny amount of mass is equal to a huge amount of energy. And he said, you have to exercise for a full week in order to work off thigh fat from a single Snickers. <laughs> oh, he's a brilliant guy, and he figured that out. It's like, wow, Okay. And uh, obviously, they didn't have Snickers probably then. That was comedian Dave Barry. (laughs) Joey Adams said, if it weren't for the fact that the TV set was so far away from the refrigerator, some of us wouldn't get any exercise at all. (laughs) I like what Irma Bombach said. She says, I've exercised with women so thin that the buzzards follow them to the car. (laughs) And my favorite one is, I work out religiously. I do one sit-up, and then I say amen. (laughs) Perfect. Being spiritually fit is absolutely important. Physically being fit is nice, but spiritually being fit is absolutely essential according to our text. We want to be in good spiritual health. And the reason for being fit spiritually There are many reasons. One of them is obviously these spiritually fit men are going to be put into positions of spiritual leadership in the church. And what do you do if you don't have spiritually fit men in your church? 
The other is that I believe firmly in my heart that people are led to the cross because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the church is called to be blameless and holy before God. Now, we have different ways of thinking. I think there's misinformation that's crept in. We somehow think that if we're like the world, the world will somehow feel a kinship with us and want to do what we do, that is worship the Lord and walk with the Lord. But how many people would have followed Jesus Christ if he was just like an average guy in town? Yeah, if his language was crass and inappropriate, if he told inappropriate stories, if he was addicted to something, uh, how many people would follow him? You see, what really stands out to me is the righteousness of Christ. You and I will be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It is the only way that we can gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven, is it not true? And now we're called upon to be holy, as God is holy. And that is no small task. I believe that what the world wants today is, is righteousness. Oh, some will beat you up over it. There's no question about that. They love their sin so much. But understand this, that there are people who are looking for a difference among Christians. And when they don't see it, there's confusion. The, the churches in Crete needed to stand out from the way the Cretans lived. They needed to have a totally different mindset when it came to sordid gain, when it came to righteous living. They needed to have a mindset that ran countercultural to their day so that other people might see and get the favorable impression of who Christ truly is. This is true even, and I'll kind of do spoiler, but here in verse 5, when he's telling the, the young women, he's saying, so that, that, that henna clause in the Greek, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And the word there literally is the word for blasphemy. It won't be blasphemed. We don't want the word of God to be blasphemed. We want to live out our Christianity in an authentic, godly manner so that the world will see that there is a stark contrast and it's worth following Jesus Christ. If the world doesn't see any difference among Christians, how is it supposed to be drawn to the truth? So I say we need sound teaching in order to become spiritually fit. There's four categories we're going to look at here this morning as we stop to, to ponder this a little bit further. And the first section is referring there in verse 2 to older men. Older men. Exactly what is an older man? How many of you are older? No, don't raise your hand. Um, I see you, Frank. Um, <laughs> older men. The, the word, uh, we get the word presbyteros, and that, that's the, the, the Greek word, and, and that's for elder. The, it's the same word, and, and it gives the idea that there's some age, there's something, um, uh, of just a nice established maturity, all right? And we're going we're gonna to contrast that with the younger men. But you can kind of figure out where you are. You might be in between. And that's where we call middle age. And middle age is anyone from 25 to 75. <laughs> Making points, aren't I? He says these older men, these who are more mature, he says you need to be characterized by the following. He says you need to be temperate. He said you need to be dignified, sensible, and sound. There's that, that word again that we get the word hygiene from. Sound or healthful in faith, love, and perseverance. The word temperate there was in a Greek word group that literally meant uh, a contrast to drunkenness. And he's basically saying you need to have that area of self-control that's going on in your life. If Paul is using that term figuratively, which he may or may not be, he's indicating a complete clarity of mind resulting in good judgment. This one who is an older man needs to be known for that. The second thing he's going to say is you, they need to be dignified. What does dignified mean? See someone who's kind of dignified. I think when I say that about someone, I'm usually doing a lot of, of reference to their outward appearance. A person who is dignified is literally a person who is worthy of respect. Their manner of life is being lived in such a way that as you get around them, you respect them. That's what dignified truly means. 
The third term that he uses there is sensible, and this is going to be applied to all of the groups in the list. This word is sophronis in the original, and, and whenever you get into to S-O-P-H and you get into that whole realm, that word means wisdom. It's the idea of having wisdom and living out a wise life. The older men are to be worthy of respect. They're needing to be self-controlled. They're needing to be wise. They live out their life in a method that is showing forth wisdom. But that's not all. He says there needs to also be faith and love and perseverance. Usually when we see the words faith and love, there's a third one that usually goes with it. What's that word? Hope, right. And instead, what Paul does is he flips hope for perseverance. And I find that interesting, and I think it's noteworthy. We know that the faith needs to be growing in the life of that older man. His faith needs to be, be advancing as he sees God provide, as he receives answers to prayer. He sees his faith truly maturing. And he sees his love as being much more comprehensive. He's able to love much more effectively as he gains age. But the last thing that Paul says, and it's so critical here, is that it also needs to be a life marked by perseverance. That it is carried right out to the end. The opportunity to finish well needs to be taken advantage of. So when you're laying on your bed in the shadow of death, there's no regrets. It's sad to note that throughout history there have been people who have given their life to following the Lord and towards the end of their life they gave in. Compromised, made bad decisions, threw off wise living, made decisions that disrupted their family, caused sin and wickedness to enter in. And they're known more by that than the wise living that preceded it. If you want to be known as one who is all of these characteristics, gentlemen, we need to carry it through to the very end. And by the grace of God, we will. That's being spiritually fit. That's being spiritually healthy on the part of the older men. Now, the part of the younger or the uh, older women, he says this in verse three, older women, he says, likewise, Going back again to what he said for the men, but he mixes it up a little bit when he says, likewise, they're to be reverent in their behavior. Reverent in their behavior. What does it mean to be reverent in your behavior? Well, that's an interesting word. In fact, it's the only place in the scriptures where Paul uses this word, and it's almost like he kind of invented this word by putting two other words with it. And the first part of this compound word, it would be translated the temple. And the idea then is to be fit for, appropriate for, the temple. He puts those two aspects together, and if Paul has it in his mind, it's almost like these women need to be, in their behavior, fit to minister in the temple of God. That's what the word reverent here is indicating. And so an older woman has learned a lot. Uh, they've matured a lot. You're in that, that point of time where you've been able to realize God's ministering in your life, and now you're dedicated to serving the Lord. You're spiritually fit. Your focus is on how you can minister for Christ and do it effectively. Paul goes on and he says that the older women are to be reverent in their behavior and not malicious gossips. Well, one of the things that was, was easy to see was it was, was, very, it was very easy to, to gossip back in the day because they would sit around and they would gather for just life in general. They weren't as harried, they could stop and they could talk, but they needed to be careful how they spoke what they talked about. Uh, do you know you can be a malicious gossip in, by just repeating things that are true? I think sometimes we think, you know, you can, in order to be a malicious gossip, you have to be spreading lies about someone. That's a slanderer. This is a person whose intention is malicious in repeating something about someone else. He says these older women 
are wised up. They know that there's not a benefit in spreading that news, and so they take a step back from it, and they control themselves in that way. And they are living out a life that's wise. They're not enslaved, he also says, to much wine. That's a place there where he mentions much wine. He, Paul does the same thing over in 1 Timothy. He talks about deacons not to be drinking much wine. It's curious in some ways because what does he mean by that? What, well, what exactly is going on? Well, let me just tell you this, that back in biblical times, uh, sub-zero refrigerators weren't invented yet. And so you had your harvest season and you picked all these wonderful grapes that you grew in your, your vineyard and what did you do with the grape juice? You just had to drink it all, right, or else it would go bad. You know that grape juice and cider and stuff, it, it, it doesn't actually turn to like a fermented drink on its own. Have you ever tried that? We used to get cider from this cider mill in western Massachusetts when I was just a little kid. And I remember we put a bottle, we'd, we'd bring the bottles back. It was an exchange deal, right? And, and I always thought that, you know, because I used to love to watch Daniel Boone. And you ever see those guys when they would get the, the, the bad guys? They were always the bad guys. But they would take those jugs and they would lift them up like this and they'd drink. And I thought, you know, it'd be great to grab a hold of that glass jug and just, you know, give it one of these. And so I, I snatched it behind the back seat of my mother's Volkswagen Bug. And after about two weeks... I figured it's probably good and strong. There was only just a little tiny bit there, enough for a big chug. And I put that on my arm as a little boy, and I gave her the chug. I want to tell you right now, that stuff didn't turn to anything but rot. It was the most disgusting poo. Oh, it was terrible. And I learned that, you know, there's a whole situation of the, they call it the laws of fermentation. So if you harvested all of your grapes and you, you wanted them not to spoil, you boiled them and you cooled them and you did all of these processes to them so that it would actually be not grape juice but wine. It was common in the time of the Apostle Paul to take that wine and mix it with anywhere from, depending on how wealthy you were, 12 to 20 parts of water. So you'd put a cup of water or 20 cups of water in with one cup of of grape or wine, and that's what you would drink. And you could drink that then all year long. It gave you something to drink other than Pepsi and Coke and, oh, wait, they didn't have that. Um, yeah, they didn't really have much of anything except for the, the water that they would drink. So that's, that's why they drank that. And so for the person who would want to become intoxicated, drinking something that was that diluted would inc cause you incredible amounts of time. So you would have to drink and drink and drink and drink and drink, and usually your bladder would give out long before you became intoxicated. But Paul says this. He says you're not to be given to and enslaved by that. He says teaching what is good instead, encouraging. Your, your ministry as an older woman is to teach that which is good, to encourage the young women. And encourage them, he says, to love their husbands and love their children. Never really understood why the Bible had to put in there that they were supposed to love their children. It seemed like it was normative. It goes without saying. But isn't it sad in the day and age in which we live, the lack of love for many parents upon their children? And it's concerning. And all of a sudden, the Bible becomes much more relative to us today. Teaching those women, encouraging those young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Of the seven adjectives here that are used for the young women, four of them involve marriage and the family. And why is it so important? Why is marriage and the family so important? Well, obviously it has impact over there in chapter one because there are qualifications there of, of these elders that are familial. It's also important because that's where their living life, that's where their real life is, that's where their day-to-day -day life is. The older women are called upon to teach the younger women to be, verse five, sensible and pure. Again, that word sensible, sophronis, means 
wise in their living. If you couple together that with pure, some people have taken that to be uh, marriage fidelity, it's hard to say. But one thing is for sure is to be living out wisely in a pure way, that's what we're called to do. And the young women are specifically commanded this here. Notice what else she has as a responsibility, speaking of the older women. To teach these younger women, she says, or he says, to be workers at home, to be kind, to be subject to their own husbands. All of these things true so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. Now, in our culture today, we look at these things, and some of these things could be viewed as, as being negative. But to literally, it's rendered to be busy at home and to be kind. Maybe it's combining the two, good workers at home. I don't know. But the idea is that they would be responsible in their behavior at home. As we would understand, there is a subjected aspect. He talks about being subject to their own husbands. The term subject, too, is interesting because it speaks here of the relationship of the husband and wife, and it's also integrated to other things in the scriptures as well. It's used in a, a bunch of different contexts. One is subjection, we're in subjection to Christ in all things, the Bible says. Romans chapter 13 says we're to be subject unto the higher power, civil government. We know that we are to be subject as Christians one to another. And Ephesians chapter 5 is going to be teaching us to be subject in a marriage relationship to one another. Where you have uh, the right subjection to Christ, to one another, you will have relationships that are growing and thriving. This is not a legal requirement in the sense that this is what has to happen, one is over the other, and one, because again, you will not have the love requirement met, and you will have disaster. This is speaking to the issue of men and women having different roles before God, but not in inequity. There is, among men and women, the same reality, and that is we are truly created in the image of God, are we not? As each one is subject to the Lord, that filters down from there. You and I are called upon to be subject to Christ. And then he says, subject to one another. And then in the marriage relationship in the home, it's a little bit different. So all these women, the older women teaching the younger women, this is what these things look like. Now it's important to note this because when we come to the section here on younger men, Paul is going to start off by saying the younger men needed to be self-controlled. And that's what he's saying here in verse, uh, verse six. Young men need to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds. So the young men are called upon to live wisely as well. Without wise living, you have chaos in whatever society you live in. If you go back to Ecclesiastes, a great book of scripture that talks about wisdom living, and you go back there uh, to Ecclesiastes, uh, you'll find there towards the end of the book the reference to a nation who has a child ruling over it. And it's not a pretty picture at all. It's, it's really not. Um, and the reason is that that, that youngster doesn't have the wisdom that's required. And so Solomon writes this in chapter 10, and he says, Woe to you, O land, whose king is a, a boy, and whose princes feast in the morning. They don't know what to do. They're, they're living in a, an unwise situation. They're not applying wisdom. Uh, they're, they're getting drunk in the morning, and uh, again, you have this naivete going on. And then he contrasts it. He says, blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility, and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Uh, the concept there is that we need wise people to lead nations. We need wise people to lead homes. We need wise moms. We need wise dads. We need wise grandparents. 
We need wise church leaders. We need wisdom desperately. And in a society that is, is throwing off wise living and the appropriateness of wisdom, we find ourselves sinking more and more into a chaotic situation. And so Paul says to the young men, you need to live wisely. Notice verse 7. It says, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Again, Paul talks to Titus here. And he says, Titus, show them by the way you live, by the good things that you're doing in your life, how to live wisely. And he specifically aims that to the younger men. Titus might have been a younger man as well. And he's saying, Titus, show them what to do. Show them how to live. Discipleship, my friends, is really what's being spoken of here. We sometimes think of discipleship as just being a Bible class, but it's more than that. Real discipleship is being able to show forth how things work and in the process of time, being able to contribute wisdom to another person. That's discipleship. Because I can look at the word of God and I can study the word of God, but teach me how to apply it. Teach me how to apply the wisdom. I don't know who came up with this statement. More is caught than taught, but it kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Titus, get out there and teach it by the way you live. Because other people are going to look at your life and they're going to try to figure out what does this wisdom living really look like? How do you really apply it? Let, let's not beat around the bush. Let's not try to, to cut corners on this. I need to know, here's my situation. This is the decisions that I'm faced with. How do I make the right decision? What do I do? And so he's called upon here as a young man to show forth that purity, purity of doctrine, to be dignified and sound in speech, having healthy speech. Those words that are helpful, those words that are healthy and beyond approach. Now, all of this is due to a culmination of things as I see it in verse 11, where the Bible teaches us, and just in closing here, for the grace of God, the Bible says, has appeared to all men. Through God's grace, we're able to receive newness of life. We can never be spiritually fit unless we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step to spiritual fitness. You need to have that personal relationship with Christ. Christ went to the cross for all of us. And he has appeared then in that way to all men. Once we place our faith and trust in Christ, it doesn't end there. All of your major authors in scripture teach about the coming time when the church is presented as the bride of Christ to Jesus himself. And we are to be presented blameless. We will be, as a church, presented holy before God. Our sin washed away. And there we will stand before the Lord. What joy that will be. In the meantime, he teaches us here fully in this passage. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, and this grace is teaching us something. Grace doesn't just leave off by being grace alone. He says that grace is instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly or wisely, righteously, and godly in the present age. I'm sure those believers in the church at Crete thought to themselves, you know, this is great for a future down the road. How are we supposed to live this way in Crete? It's impossible. I mean, everywhere you went, it was just miserable sin and wickedness. And what's he say in this present age? He says we're to live righteously, pushing away these, these desires that are wicked. A funny thing happens to us. If we're going to be spiritually fit, we have to exercise. How many of you exercised regularly at one time of your life? Now, I am including recess when you were in elementary school. <laughs> because that was a big time. That was my favorite class. And it never was long enough. But, but how many of you, you, you know what it's like, right? 
amazing thing happens. When you stop exercising, your body changes again. I'll tell you, I have a little cousin, and uh, he's literally little, but he's like 50 years old now. And uh, I remember when he was in high school, he worked out seven hours every single day. Seven hours, including Christmas, right? And he was ripped. I mean, this kid was ripped. I mean, he didn't have one ounce of fat on him. I mean, he could just, he could do stuff that I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I would try to do this stuff and be injured, sometimes near fatally. <laughs> and he went on and he went to the Olympics. And you can probably see him on TV right now. He's broadcasting. He's a broadcaster for NBC for the uh, men's and women's gymnastics because he won a gold medal in 1984. Yeah. Well, we heard him. I heard his voice, and I said, oh, I said, we got to tape this so that I can see what he looks like now. I haven't seen him in a bazillion years. And you know what's amazing? He looks just like me now. <laughs> he went right back, poof, right in the hopper. I mean, it's the coolest thing. So, <laughs> so all those things in Ecclesiastes are true, you know? You kind of just kind of go back, you know? It's just like, yes! Sick. Our spiritual fitness is the same way. When we read God's word, when we pray, when we worship... We study, we grow, and we grow stronger and stronger. And when we take a step back and take a spiritual vacation, we revert back. And we don't lose our salvation. We can never lose that. But we can be controlled by the flesh so easily, can't we? This spiritual fitness is of absolute significance. Multiply my life, Lord, that I, through being spiritually fit. Give me years ahead where I'm spiritually fit and I can serve you effectively. Let's pray together. As we bow our heads before the Lord, there are two things that come to mind. One is, the grace of God. And let me ask you a question this morning. How has the grace of God affected you? Has it changed your life? When I think of the grace of God, I'm thinking of the person of Jesus Christ who left heaven voluntarily and came to a world full of sin. And when he came, he endured the scorn of sinful men to the point all the way of allowing those sinful, wicked people to put him on the cross. Those sinful, wicked people are people like you and me. We would have done the same thing. But by his grace, he went to that cross, and through the power of God, it, he came forth from the grave. Jesus Christ, being God himself, made the ultimate sacrifice. Have you placed your faith in him? and him alone? Do you have assurance of where you're going to spend your eternity because of that faith? Or are you unclear? This morning he is willing to save all those who will come and place their faith in him. Will you make that decision today? And perhaps you're here and you recognize the need to be spiritually fit. Maybe you've gotten a little out of shape lately. God's been tugging at your heart. How I encourage you to be disciplined in this area and apply the truths of God's word so that your life reflects that wise living. If God's working in your heart today, how I pray that you'll make a decision that he, through the power of the spirit of the Lord, is urging you to make. Would you stand with me? We'll have a word of prayer together. There are folks here at the front of the church after I pray that if you'd like to, to pray with someone, talk with someone, I invite you to come and, and see them after the service.
Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you, Father, for the grace of God that's appeared to all men. A grace, Lord, that is wrapped all around this world. A grace extended to people of our past, people, all people today, and people who will be born tomorrow. Lord, how we pray, Father, that you would continue to do great work in the hearts of men. Father, how I pray if there's anyone here today who's, who's standing in that, that time period of their life of making a decision, that today they would place faith in Jesus and him alone. And have the joy, Lord, of knowing that they're on their way to heaven, not because of anything that they've done, but because of what was done for all of us on the cross. Lord, as well, I pray for those, Father, who have perhaps fallen spiritually out of shape. Pray that you'd work in our hearts, Lord. Help us to renew a commitment to being spiritually in shape. Renew a commitment to wise living. That we might reflect well the word of God. As your word says, so that the word of God might not be blasphemed. Help us, Lord, as ambassadors for our Savior this week to reflect well the person of our Savior, Jesus. Help us, Father, to reflect well our love for you. Help us, Father, to reflect well our dedication to you, Lord, that we may, might be pleasing in all ways to you, our Savior. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.